Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wade. I'm the assistant curator for Through the Mesh at Neem uh, in Limassol. And I'm here today with Morishin Aliari, um, a fabulous new media artist. And the uh, her work, Physical Tactics for Digital Colonialism, which is a performance and a video piece that was originally debuted at the New Museum in 2017. Um, we're here to talk about it and the relationships between uh, digital colonialism artifacts, provenance, and how this fits into the whole story of uh, Through the Mesh. Um, to get us started, Morishin, I was wondering if you could, you know, talk a little bit about what digital colonialism means and how you first started to uh, come into con contact with this, with this idea and this uh, kind of mode of resistance. Hi, um, thanks so much for having me, Wade. It's always an honor to work with you, speak to you, discuss ideas. Um, so this was, um, digital colonialism was a concept that I um, came up with and also like developed since 2015. This was directly in relation to um, the work that, um, you know, I had started uh, to, to, to do in 2015 called Material Speculation Isis, which was a project in which I reconstructed um, 12 artifacts, a selection of basically artifacts that were destroyed at Mosul Museum by Isis members. Um, some of you might remember the video at a time which was, you know, went viral. So there was like a lot of discussions and kind of like a shock around the video and this kind of like act of destruction um, being, born and raised you know in iran and kind of like sharing a lot of that history of um both assyrian era and also um some of these like ancient artifacts that you know at a time was destroyed um this is not does not mean that i'm coming to it from like a nationalistic nationalistic sense but like rather kind of like be being very familiar with that history and like growing up with it um and as well as kind of um, my own practice, which has been for years um, about archiving, using technology to archive, um, refigure uh, or like uh, rethink the possibilities of, um, you know, historical elements, realities, stories. Um, all these kind of like was a reason that I wanted to reconstruct these artifacts that were destroyed using um, digital fabrication and 3D printing technology. But at a the time, there was also this um, very huge hype of um, doing this kind of reconstruction work by tech companies. Um, especially in the in the Bay Area um, and you know in general global north, a lot of these companies having access to technologies like 3D scanners and 3D um, 3D printers, and especially 3D scanners and going to different parts of uh, you know countries in the global south, especially at a time the Middle East that was. Uh, under a lot of conflict because of what was going on in Syria and also um, the the rise and um, kind of um, the power that ISIS had at a time in the region um, kind of brought together this uh, situation where a lot of these companies were like claiming that they want to go to the Middle East or like these 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 parts of the world that there's conflict um, and save the cultural heritage of um, these, these spaces. And as I did more research and thinking and looked at the projects that was like coming out, I became very curious about these acts of um, saving and reconstruction and scanning and gathering data. And so, you know, I kind of, again, developed this um, concept of digital colonialism, which um, in general, it's about the, the tendency of um, colonial powers in, in the ways that they have access or um, they kind of um, take away or have ownership of data of um, other, other countries. And yeah. uh, this kind of became the, the, the more like, I guess, the, the point of departure for creating that performance physical tactics for digital colonialism. Yeah, it's honestly an amazing kind of masterclass in in all of these issues. And it's, I really love the format and the way that you bring together all of these ideas and talk about it almost in, an, in a retrospective sense, because it is, it, it, you know, gives it this kind of scope that I think is really valuable. Um, you know, I, the, it's, it's, you know, the, 
this idea of the colonization of data and the ownership of data is such like a modern concept and such a damaging one in so many ways. And, you know, something that I think is really present in this work is the tension between the capacity for this technology, um, you know, particularly 3D scanning and like databases and archives to, on the one hand, you know, offer one group of people uh, the capacity to care for uh, these cultural legacies, but on the other hand, to enact like deep violence and theft, um, you know, amongst other harms to them. And I'm wondering how you, you know, as you are embarking on this project, how you were able to kind of navigate through that tension. Yeah, I mean, that is uh, such a great point. And I think you can really take this point and think about a lot of other technological tools that have this kind of double sword um, aspect to them, right? Like how there is, there's all, first of all, there's no technology that is neutral. Um, that's something that is really important to understand. Um, and this connection between culture and technology in a way that a technology influences or create a culture and at the same time, a culture can uh, be very important in a way that is te that a technology is invented and a way that a technology is applied. So whether that culture is, you know, a male Western colonial mindset culture, or, um, you know, if it's not, then what kind of dif different applications we can have or um, see a technology through. So, um, you know, for me, I think part of um, this, this relationship that for the longest time I, ha I have developed with technological tool has always been to um, have kind of not 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 lose sight in terms of this aspect of technology and like keep this like critical thinking of the technology uh, whenever there are new tools or like um, new ideas around technological tools come around and like really ask difficult questions about them right and I mean I think that's what to me a good artist does whatever the tool it is that they use or whatever the tool it is that comes to um, you know, to the world in terms of uh, from commercial use of it to then a creative, more like artistic underground use of it. Um, so yeah, that's that's something that I guess, um, again, for me, it's not just about a technology like 3D scanning, but rather um, many other technological, you know, you can think about AI, you can think about um, a book, you know, as a technology, like how it can go so many ways, right? You can write a whole like fascist book about something that is, or like a racist book or like whatever, or you, you can use it actually in a way to educate a public against those things, right? Um, so I think it's more of a general way of thinking about these tools. Absolutely. And I mean, the thing that I think a lot about in these conversations is literacy, you know, as technology advances at a fast pace, and we don't even, you know, particularly the public, but even the creators, you know, can't understand the implications or can't know how what the what all of the use cases are like building literacy feels like the most critical effort in a lot of ways so that we really can read and critique and understand the the impacts of these things and as you said exactly it's interconnected it's not just 3d scanning it's the database it's the algorithmic environment that's processing it it's um you know it's the social function and how that interacts with like a a, a display environment you know it's 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 complicated and and highly political um and absolutely i mean i also think that it's this binary aspect of how these technological tools are created that has caused you know always this like tension between like let's say um a silicon valley tech scene versus a more like critical educational academic based way of thinking about technology right i mean i wish that there were like more ways that these two worlds could um come together and and don't feel like such distance places because often it does you know I remember like living at a time when I was like working on material speculation ISIS project I was doing a residency at Autodesk Pier 9 that's where I made all of those pieces and the residency program was like super supportive amazing amazing team there but there were definitely times that like random staff at Autodesk like would like walk in into the the, the place where I was like 3d printing or like cleaning my sculptures and 
you know, they were like, what, what, what is she doing here? Like we, nobody like could like in some ways also like make sense of why I was doing what I was doing at a time. So there was always this like weird, awkward distance um, or kind of dismissiveness in the way that they would like look at what I was doing until like it got a lot of like press and attention and then they were interested in it. That's so, I mean, it's, that's so funny. Like, you know, I think that again, it speaks to the systems of power that are embedded within these images and these symbols and just kind of like the world that artists need to operate in general that is, are driven by all these kind of invisible factors that, you know, guide the way people look at something and ultimately their own literacy in, in the media object. Um, but, you know, something else that feels really cogent in this piece is, you know, of course, you know, you're you don't succumb to utopianist utopian solutionism in this in in this work and through this project you know you're not claiming to could totally solve the problem you're pointing out all of the frailties as well um but yet despite that there does feel to be something that is quite reclamatory in this act of scanning archiving making re replicas and i'm wondering how you know kind of looking in the rearview mirror do you feel like a kind of reclamation was made possible through this project? And, you know, if so, like how successful was that? Um, do you mean like from like a certain scene or like, I think or like, like you know, just kind of reclaiming these artifacts, their stories, their histories and their, you know, interpersonal importance from either, you know, the powers that be that, you know, contain the digital archives, or, you know, in the, in the uh, kind of wake of their physical destruction. Right, right. I mean, I feel like since I started like working on that piece, as well as uh, when I kind of started to do a lot of like lectures and thinking and writing around digital colonialism, like really researching, spending a lot of years like researching and like keeping an eye on um, these kind of practices by different um, institutions, including Google Art and Culture um, Institute. So um, it's like, uh, for, for me as an art artist, I think who, again, like sees a connection between a lot of these practices in a way that is being done by these places and the way that I think should be done with more consideration, with more, again, doubt and making sure like that there's like ethics in the way that it's practiced. Um, yeah, I think, I mean, like looking back at the last like um, five years of doing this work, I definitely do feel like um, not just me, but like myself and like there are a couple of other artists that kind of like work within this same kind of space, specifically with focusing on cultural heritage, um, artists, scholars, thinkers, um, that um, we are like building an, another way of another space, another ways of, again, uh, reclaiming and protecting and or like at least wanting to protect like some of the ways that these things are are, are done and just like used again and just like I feel like very like careless dismissive like just very like um you you, you mentioned it like um utopian or kind of techno solutionist way right and um, I do see that, that, that through these years, there has been an influence. There has been conversations that was, didn't really exist back then. I mean, up to this day, like I'm always amazed when like I go into a university or like an institution and I talk about this notion of digital colonialism. And I love, especially with like younger students at university, like I love when I see the, the you know, this kind of moment like aha moments that like happens in their brain where they're like wow i never like thought about that you know i mean when you think about historical colonialism if you go to like let's say a, a museum space or like whatever and you you go to met or a british museum or like whatever and you see a physical object that is like huge and is obviously like stolen from somewhere or like there's like a lot of conversation around like physical historical colonialism when it comes to museums and institutions and i think the whole thing with digital colonialism um, is still there's a lot of gray areas, there's a lot of unknown in it, or ways that people have not really thought about the problem with colonizing or ownership of data or knowledge in a way that people would more clearly see it within a physical object. Um, and yeah, so I really love that myself and a bunch of other people, we're, we're here at work trying to kind of 
you know, build spaces that um, will will um, make people want to know more and want to reconsider ways that they do these kind of practices. It's, you know, it's so amazing. Your work, I also comes to mind the work of Juan Cavelli, who is scanning um, and creating 3D models of uh, South American indigenous artifacts that have been stolen, or Julia Tagil, who is going around and scanning um, and creating 3D sculptures of patriarchal artifacts in Mexico City. I think that this all, you know, it's a really interesting medium for examining what our spatial relationship to these histories are and how they kind of affect us in embodied ways. Um, and, you know, something that's really, you know, the, the 3D scanner and 3D imaging technologies are something that, you know, you've dealt with a lot um, in your practice. I'm thinking, you know, particularly of the 3D Additivist Manifesto with Daniel Rourke, which is an amazing project. Um, and, you know, you, in really interestingly, and I think we even have a note about this in the, in the, leaflet the text about the work you know you describe the 3d scanner as a tool of witchcraft and magic um but you also say that we should put it to use and let it colonize the colonizers and i'm wondering if you could expand on that a little bit and you know tell us how we might be able to put that into practice yeah i mean that's a very great question i you know with the the physical tactics for digital colonials and the performance lecture that i did at new museum you know, I was kind of like bringing together these like two worlds of poetics and imagination. And as I call it, they're like a court session in which, you know, we're there. If, if there, there was a court session and I could like claim these things with and like would want, want answers from these, these, again, institutions that I'm like focusing on there, these tech institutions. Um, and also kind of, again, bridging that with theory with um kind of like a little bit more like dry academic text so there is there are sections within this performance where i'm telling a story so i have like a selection of objects um and uh, i take them and then we're scanning them live during the performance and as they're scanning i'm telling a story of that object its connection to myself personally where it came from how it was given to me and then using something symbolic within that for example an object that has a picture of like you know a persian miniature uh, battle you know and then like connect that to these like acts of like violence and then like i talk about violence care blah 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 so it kind of becomes um this this way of like bridging again like poetics and storytelling and imagination to um to 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 again more like theory and in this scenario you know i imagined 3d scanning to be this tool that is being used on stage by like myself and another um person um who is kind of like assisting with a uh with the tech aspect of um, the project so you know um, it's it was always my this kind of my, my dream of seeing these tools you know taken out of the hand of again the, the, the tech male uh, which is using them mostly in the ways that these acts of digital colonialism is happening with the technology like 3d scanner and then with this performance um I kind of again imagined this in the hands of now two two women who, who are like running it and using it and putting it in use as tools for um, again yeah like witchcraft as you also mentioned uh, and the the person who is who is that running the scanner is um, Ros uh, Rosalie Yu and they also you know being a person of color as well so that was kind of my dream my utopia of how else I saw this thing to be used to tell stories to connect it to poetics um but also being used by by women and then there's this sense of like magic in a way that you see an object getting scanned coming to life pixel by pixel right I mean I think that that visual element itself there's like some ghostly magical sense to it in a way that an object becomes that becomes a 3d model pixel by pixel in that process of physical to digital um and so i'm kind of like mixing together i i guess all these elements i really love this aspect of your practice where you take 
something physical and you bring in this kind of ritual importance and potency. Um, you know, I'm constantly thinking about, you know, colleagues of mine that work um, in collections in, uh, for instance, New Zealand, where they have Maori artifacts that, you know, according to the, the local native, the local indigenous groups, um, the, those objects, even the virtual 3D scans need to be treated with the same ritual conditions as you would treat the physical object because they don't see them as as different or separate. Um, and I love how you, you know, I think that oftentimes we think of these digital objects and representations as kind of separate to derivative of lesser than. Um, and I love the the meaning and the emotion um, and the cultural value that you're kind of reinscribing into them. And I think that, you know, that feels like a really valuable tactic for the uh, refusal or the, you know, push back against these kind of digital col colonializing forces. Um, you know, I, I think, the, you know, this show too, it overall is a lot about, you know, geopolitical power and firewalls and access and lack of access and kind of the, the physical and digital borders that, you know, block us from connecting with each other. Um, and so I'm wondering, you know, of course, you know, you come from, you know, you come from Iran where that, you know, where there are firewalls and very strict border restrictions in place. Um, and I'm wondering how, you know, whether related to this project or more broadly, um, you grapple with those different ways that access is denied. Um, I think particularly if you're creating, you know, for instance, you're creating this digital archive of, of these objects. And, you know, I imagine that in many places in the world, perhaps folks can't access them. Yeah, I mean, that's a very important question, something that I often you know, I talk about also, I like consider it in a way that I am dealing with my my own work, you know, in a way that I give access to certain thing, how I give access to it, um, who is it for, right? So, and then again, this uh, space between protecting knowledge while also giving um, access to knowledge. In this project I did actually like recently, which was uh, uh, to release an archive of my She Who Sees the Unknown series, um, an archive online on a platform uh, where if you know um, Farsi or Arabic, you can access have access to all the layers of the archive, which are four layers, um, you know, very highly specifically curated. These are um, archive of books and manuscripts and images that are rare that I've, I've spent like around like four or five years gathering from different um, spaces in the Middle East and, and beyond. Um, so if you don't know Arabic or Farsi, you won't be able to have access to the full archive. You can have access only to the first layer of the archive. Um, there are these cultural codes that I have defined, um, meaning that you have to kind of put in these codes in to then go to the next layers of the archive. And that's when you need to know the Arabic or Farsi language. Um, so these, this, this whole work that I did from material speculation, the way I shared my own research, the way I held on to um, 3D models of um, the artifacts, uh, I only released one, which was King Utha as part of my material speculation, um, zip, um, this like zip folder that I released. It only contained one of the 3D artifacts, um, like model of 3D artifacts, and I held on to the rest because I really wondered what happens if I release um, one and, you know, my sus suspicions was correct, which is what happened was 99.9% of people who 3D printed them, uh, the, the King Utha model, um, where people who were based on global um, north, mostly Western people, um, and so, you know, I am still like working towards ways that I can um, have both the, the, the 3D printed sculptures, which are unique additions, as well as um, the digital files given back to an institution in the Middle East. So that has been a work in progress. There has been a lot of conversation back and forth, and I'm still working on the destiny of that work. Um, again, being very aware of where it is that I want to stand in terms of giving access and protecting knowledge. 
Absolutely. Well, we're, I'm so excited to see kind of how this manifests over time. Um, and, you know, really appreciate, you know, the, 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 the level of care um, and thoughtfulness that is going into this. I mean, it's a real asset um, for, for these objects, for the people that they're important to, and, you know, just for cultural heritage more, more broadly. Um, thank you so much for, for chatting with me today. Thanks so much. It's always such an honor. Thanks for your thoughtful, beautiful questions. And I really hope that we can do more of, of this. Absolutely. Um, Physical Tactics for Digital Colonialism. Um, it's a 40 minute video. It's on view as part of Through the Mesh. Thanks so much.